So we will begin this session with opening comments from Adam Jenke, and then we'll open the floor to you all to get our conversation started. All right, Adam, take it away. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, my name is Adam Jenke. I am in sort of a unique spot in this session because I bet I'm the furthest from a livestock expert among everybody on the call. Uh, but I am, I do uh, research and education on land stewardship and natural resource stewardship generally at Iowa State. My role is the extension wildlife specialist. And I happen to be sort of the person trying to frame up our discussion and plan for this session, which is all really about you all, about your thinking about the future of integrating livestock and um, perennial plants into Iowa's landscapes to have a series of benefits associated with both sustaining farms and livelihoods in rural communities. And also the thing that me as a wildlife biologist and natural resource professional thinks about the most, uh, provisioning of what we call ecosystem goods and services. And so I uh, want to just kind of say that I'm humbly approaching today's presentation as an effort to try to just listen. But in order to get us all on the same page, I'm going to talk just briefly here this morning about why it is that we thought it would be helpful to get you all in the room, get your perspectives on this and try to help us as educators at Iowa State and in, with PFI and a series of other collaborators um, uh, set a course for regenerative grazing and perennial ecosystems in Iowa's landscape. So that's, that's where we're going. I have just a few quick uh, remarks to make. Um, Building on what I just introduced is, uh, this is a figure out of a recent paper that Megan was actually involved with and a number of other people in the upper Midwest were talking about how it is that we could bring uh, regenerative livestock production operations into uh, the upper Midwest. And to, in association with what I just introduced, this idea of grazing is in perennial systems are good for the farm and they're good for society. The approach that the frame that I take is the good for society part. And I think the frame that many of you all uh, take is the good for the farm part. And that seems like a win-win opportunity when we look at these things. We know that more perennial vegetation on the landscape is going to help us address big societal issues like climate change, soil erosion and degradation, water quality and biodiversity declines. And then we of course know that it can also be an important part of production far, productive farms as I think it's really nicely captured with this figure from this paper. What we also know about perennial ecosystems in Iowa specifically is that they've been on the decline since European colonization of the state. And so we know that uh, in the early 1800s, Iowa's dominant ecosystem of course was the tall grass prairie uh, we estimate somewhere around 80% of the state was in tall grass prairie. And then uh, the difference was in uh, primarily other perennial ecosystems, forests and oak savannas, uh, comprising 98% or so of the land area. Now, I actually took some liberties on that 98% thing because we know many native peoples had settlements and farms uh, distributed around the state, but we don't have a great accounting of the total land area of those, those pieces, but we know perennial ecosystems were by far the dominant land cover. Uh, of course, that changed appreciably following the Industrial Revolution and has declined ever since. So in 1938, we estimate uh, from um, some, his, some back forecasted land cover data that I used to summarize these values, which is based on national ag statistics surveys and other data sources, we estimate about 37% of Iowa's land area was in perennial vegetation forest between forests and grasslands. In 1970, 32% of Iowa's landscapes was in forests and grasslands. And today we estimate from land cover data, only 24% is in perennial vegetation. Uh, we imagine a scenario, what we wanted to get people in the room together to discuss is this scenario where we get back to some uh, increased prevalence of perennial vegetation in our landscape to provide all those societal goods that I introduced on that first slide about addressing climate change and addressing water quality and soil health and biodiversity declines. And so we don't know what the exact 
number for the right amount of perennial vegetation is on Iowa's landscape. And if you ask 30 people, I suspect you'll get 30 different answers and so on. Uh, but we do know from some work that Lisa Schulte Moore and uh, who's on the call today and Drake Larson, who I also see is on the call today has done, have done in Iowa is that there's sort of a consensus idea that perhaps about a third of Iowa's landscape being in perennial vegetation would be good for farms, good for farmers, good for rural communities, and of course good for environmental stewardship. And so if we if we consider this 32% number, then we need to think about where it is that that 32% occurs. Uh, we, of course, wouldn't imagine that 32% would just be clustered in one corner of the state and the rest would be perennial vegetation or developed land. Uh, rather, we think that this perennial vegetation to get the greatest environmental or ecosystem goods and services needs to be put in strategic places in the landscape and here's another figure actually from Drake uh, about uh, where we could imagine perennial vegetation fitting most appropriately in our working landscapes. And our idea for this is that we want to put perennial vegetation where it's going to have disproportionate impacts on both uh, farm productivity and profitability or on um, environmental services or ecosystem goods and services. So we can look at some of those places. Where would we have perennial vegetation in Iowa's ideal landscapes? One point is that we should try to keep that 25% that we already have uh, in, in certain places. In many, many scenarios, it's there for a good reason related to conditions of the land. And so keeping perennial vegetation, that's something we should remember given long-term declines, how do we ensure that we keep the perennial vegetation that we have? And then we want to start to think about where do we put it back into our working landscapes, areas that are today that cropland uh, uh, category in those bar charts I was showing. So we think there's a lot of opportunity for strategically integrating perennials into row crop landscapes, such as profit loss areas. Some work by another person on the call today, Dr. Emily Heaton, uh, estimates that about 12% of Iowa's cropland areas are annually unprofitable, and those would be flood prone areas or other degraded areas, and that's a place we could find perennial vegetation, uh, places for perennial vegetation. We also know perennial vegetation is disproportionately important along riparian ecosystems like rivers and streams, and we think we want to find ways and reasons to put perennial vegetation back there. Uh, work by another person on the call today, Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore and a really diverse team at Iowa State finds that just small changes in the proportion of a row crop field and perennial vegetation can have disproportionate impacts on wildlife, soil health, and water quality uh, through the prairie strips program. So putting prairie strips back in the right places and working landscapes could help. And then the subject near and dear to my wildlife biologist and duck enthusiast heart is wetland ecosystems. The state nutrient reduction strategy estimates we need 7,500 targeted wetlands placed around the state to address uh, challenges related to nitrates and drain tile. There's a lot of perennial vegetation that comes with those 7,500 wetlands. And we could imagine that as being another strategic way to integrate perennials back into our landscape. And so what we want to talk about today, I just introduced most of these uh, characters or many of these characters that are on the call and going to help us facilitate this discussion with you all is how can we integrate livestock into the, the vision of Iowa's landscape that has increased prevalence of perennial vegetation and uh, perennial vegetation put in places that will provide the greatest good to both society and the landowner or farmer um, or uh, whatever arrangement we have in the land use scenario. So this is related to a grant that we just received uh, to sort of do some of this listening, envisioning in Iowa um, through in collaboration with PFI, the Iowa Beef Center and the uh, new initiative that Megan mentioned called Sea Change at Iowa State. Um, the people on this call today that are involved explicitly with this grant are Dan Loy with the Iowa Beef Center, Megan, who you've already met with PFI, and then Lisa, Omar, and me with Iowa State. And again, we're going to be playing this listening role. We're just going to be trying to facilitate discussions in two different breakout rooms 
where we really want to hear your perspectives on how we get to this scenario where about a third of Iowa's landscapes in working perennial vegetation. So we have two questions for you, two breakout rooms. We're going to wrap up by 11 o'clock. The first, and I'm not going to say anything more, I just wanted to set the stage for how it is that we're thinking about this stuff and ask you to keep that in mind about that precision integration of perennial vegetation and working landscapes when you help us answer these questions about how does livestock production fit into these working landscapes and how do we get there in the short term. So the first breakout room session that we're going to have is going to be uh, asking this first question. And what we want to do is we want to break free of all of the sort of short term challenges that we are not naively ignoring. We just want to sort of separate some of the short term barriers, immediate barriers to landscape change and ask you to imagine a scenario where we are uh, in 2071 and we've gotten there. We have that at least one third of Iowa's landscape back in perennial vegetation. We wanna ask you what that landscape looks like, imagining that in 50 years. So that's our first breakout session. Each one of these breakout sessions is gonna have two people from our team in it. One is gonna be a facilitator. That's um, me, Megan and Dan are the facilitators. And then there's gonna be a note taker and that's gonna be Omar, Emily, who just raised her hand, and who's our third note taker? I don't, I'm working Lisa. with that. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. And Lisa will be a note taker. So again, we're just going to try to help you understand the question and that we really want to get your feedback on these sessions. So thank you for doing this. I think I'm looking at you, Megan. Did I cover it all? Are we ready to break out? All I have to add is that when we do break out folks, which it looks like we're going to be in groups of about 11, 12 people, um, can you, if you're able, can you please um, use your video um, so we can really converse and see each other? That would be great. And other than that, we're going to go into our first breakout, which will last about 12 minutes. Awesome. So we're going to do a report out from each group. Um, Omar, do you want to start? Um, unless Dan is supposed to facilitate that. Okay, yeah. I, I could though. Dan's group. Well, yeah, so I, I can uh, I can start and Omar, uh, if I if you took yes. good notes, if I leave anything behind or, or uh, forget something, you can you can jump in any time. You bet. But um, you know, our group, you're right, we just got started and uh, and we're just having a really good conversation and hopefully we can continue it and and uh, and so forth. But um, the vision that our group had was um, uh, a various, not just these cattle that you see in the background, but various livestock species. We heard from a dairy farmer who was actually milking cows at the time. We got to watch that. Uh, a producer that co-grazes sheep and cattle. Uh, we uh, had a producer that is uh, a pasture swine operator. So uh, very diversified uh, livestock systems was, uh, was uh, mentioned. One of the other interesting things that was brought up is when you have more livestock, you also have more people and more community. And that was something that I think resonated with our group all the way through. Uh, there was some discussion of not just perennials, but more silvopasture, uh, perennials that are integrated with, uh, with trees and forests on the landscape as part of that. Um, and then within the, the cropping systems, uh, part of this vision was cropping systems that were also more diverse with cover crops, with summer annuals, including in rotations, more diverse rotations that might include vegetables and others. So just a, a very diverse um, uh, landscape, both from the standpoint of animals, uh, forage and plant species, uh, people and community. And, and I think uh, that, that uh, was probably the, the overarching uh, vision that our group had. I don't know where I am as far as time. Omar, did, did I, what did I leave out? Uh, there was a, a general call for just having a lot of diversity and people as well, diverse skill sets uh, with you know, people with excellent communication skills, uh, marketing, entrepreneurs, artisans, teachers of all kinds. Um, let's see, what else do I have here? Um, mobile infrastructure, um, 
in silva pastures having like multifunctional living perimeter fences uh, incorporated into that and also boosting like forage chains with incorporating annuals in the perennial systems as well in rotation you kind of touched on that um, i think otherwise you covered it thanks guys adam let's hear from your group Yes, um, we had the same challenge that I think we could have probably talked for another hour or so, uh, the direction we were heading, but we did have a lot of people share some interesting perspectives we heard that are also pretty consistent with what Dan said. Um, so given the tight timeline, I won't go over everything, but uh, we also talked about getting more people involved, specifically more people involved with different or traditionally no access to land because they don't own it or uh, traditionally rent it. So just getting more people involved in agriculture. We heard about um, another consideration for land ownership and livestock ownership is uh, a vision for something like a cooperative grazing system where people are grazing, groups of people are grazing land that they don't own uh, that's on, for example, like uh, protected areas within quarter sections. Um, and uh, some interesting discussion and thinking about land ownership and the traditional model and sort of movement towards a different model that has more explicit protections within at a finer scale. Um, we talked about challenges that th that this creates, which I think we're going to talk about in the next breakout a lot, like that there's current rules that prohibit systems like that. We talked about civil pasture as well, integration of rows of trees in grazing um, ruminants, grazing pigs in the forest, pasture raised poultry, uh, and tr just general integration of trees and shrubs. And also um, more on uh, ownership strategies and silt in Iowa was raised as an example. And there was also an example shared from Michigan uh, where there's uh, sort of community level ownership and grazing as a neat example. And then finally, we just had some good questions about like, what do we mean when we say large scale? What species of livestock are we talking about? Questions that we think we don't necessarily have the answers to, of course, and we wanna to try to get there in painting this vision for the system. So uh, Emily, unless I missed anything, that would be the wrap up from our room. Thanks, Adam. Okay, I'll report out for group three. So many of the, the same concept that, that were men mentioned were around cooperative management of thousands of acres and, and land owned in common. Um, and with specifically with people who have land user rights. Um, so a lot of cooperative management talk, but some unique concepts that came up that haven't been mentioned yet were, um, that the landscape is still producing as much as it produces today, but it will look different. So the, the meat that's produced is pasture raised, um, there's oil produced and that there are different grains, a diverse amount of different grains and small grains. And, and the oil could be from a cooperatively owned oil press that is used to press all kinds of nut oils that replaces soybean and canola oil. Um, we talked about property lines become, becoming non-existent and with that and that cooperative land ownership or management, um, someone had mentioned opportunities for non-farmers to do walking trips from farm to farm with overnight stays while they learn along the way. Um, some people said that, you know, they hear and see many, many grassland birds, older growth trees, um, a diversity of people and plants and children running around. Um, someone said that they don't smell um, pig manure from manure lagoons. Um, and let's see, what, what else, Lisa? That was great, Megan. I guess one of the things uh, that was brought up too was just this, uh, you know, human and animals, you know, bound uh, historically through this evolutionary relationship. And, you know, currently modern humans have kind of, you know, we've kind of divorced ourselves in many ways. Not saying that this group falls into that category, but when we think about our society and how, having to um, uh, divorce ourselves from that necessary relationship and an opportunity to, to, um, get it back in really smart ways. 
I should also add, we did have several comments about, you know, taking lessons from indigenous people and their land management and also, you know, the, the talk about land reparation and um, bringing native peoples um, back into the fold. So, okay, so with that, we're going to go into our second breakout. Thank you, Adam. Do you want to introduce this? Yes, yes. Okay, um, so, and we're staying on schedule. And again, thank you for going along with us on this really rapid sort of deal here. So now we're breaking out of 2071. We just articulated the vision for 2071. And we, we asked you and everybody went along really well with this to focus on that long-term vision and not necessarily short-term barriers. Now we wanna acknowledge that of course, there's a ton of short-term barriers in place here to getting to this. And so what we want you to do is help us understand how we could get to a system that has more perennial uh, vegetation, iOS landscapes and more livestock integrated. And we want you to, we want to ask you, how do we get there? So specifically for you and your neighbors, what would be the one change that would help us move towards this vision in the next two years and also in the next 10 years? And so we're going to break out now. We'd like for you to address this question in your group. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to report out, summarize it all, and we'll be out of here by 11. Thanks all for sharing your thoughts. And let's do our report out again. We'll have to be kind of quick because we only have about six minutes left in this session. So Dan Loy. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll be quick and I'll kind of start where we, where we ended. We had a, a long discussion about land access and, and especially for young producers and, and that is a major stumbling block and issue. Uh, another issue that was brought up was uh, that this can't be confined to southern Iowa or it, it needs to be in, uh, included in some of the large crop production areas of the state. And most of the bulk of our conversation was about policy and things that, that needed to be changed relative to policy for this to go forward. Changes in uh, CRP, uh, grassland CRP specifically, there are some limitations there. Um, there a continued conversation of, of building uh, uh, the, you know, kind of a, a culture of, of conflict resolution and, and uh, people working together. Um, but uh, a lot of discussion about some, some policy things that could be done initially to get this jump started. Uh, Omar, I don't know if there's anything important that I, I missed in that report back, but that's kind of a short synopsis. There's a need, we have a major need for processing capacity if we're gonna make this vision a reality. So uh, aggregators and distribution. Um, and then also, uh, yeah, land access right now is a major issue uh, because of the capital investment of in row crop agriculture. Um, just financially, it's inaccessible for your beginning farmers. So figuring out incentive mechanisms for beginning farmers to be able to access those acres to incorporate livestock. Um, but that, you know, that goes in with policy as well. Okay, let's hear from Adam. Okay, um, we, we also had a very wide ranging discussion, talked a lot about policy and talked also a lot about um, uh, spotlighting bright spots, people that are making it work. Um, we started a conversation about just how do you compete with the fact that grain prices, high grain prices and, and a way to generate revenue in these systems today is mostly focused on grain production. And uh, that led to a discussion about uh, differences between risk portfolios of, of uh, grain production and livestock production and there a need to try to uh, mitigate the risk in livestock production in a way that has been done in grain production. Um, again, spotlighting small successes, people that are um, making it work on their farm. Uh, starting, one idea is starting in extant perennial acres. So like, for example, if silvo pasture, integrating that into extant pastures rather than trying to find new pastures right away. Um, one discussion I'm trying to connect across the time that we spent, one discussion about like landowners having interest in doing these regenerative practices on their lands, but being mismatched with people that can do those practices, like the current farmers or some of the context around there. And also we had a farmer share that although 
uh, interest in getting into these regenerative practices, time doesn't necessarily allow or resources don't necessarily allow for it. So, so there's um, land that could be used in this way, but there's mismatches in, in different scales. And so supporting uh, those innovations could be good. Uh, and then lots of time on finding markets, uh, marketing approaches, differences between agribusiness and direct marketing, and there needing to be some sort of middle ground between the two extremes. Um, and then the policy about government support. And even we talked about uh, health insurance and how that would be helpful for, for many farmers. So I hope that captures it. And Emily, I trust you're gonna fill in the gaps. Yeah, I think Adam, you, you covered it pretty well and I certainly took notes, but I think the one thing that stood out to me in this breakout session when we really um, moved from describing the problems to talking about the solutions, they, um, they were pretty dramatic in some cases. So, uh, you know, we talked about campaign finance reform. We talked about defunding the USDA and using that money for things that are needed elsewhere, like for instance, health insurance. And then they were also really practical, like just doing it, just growing something so people can buy it. So we had a, had a range of solutions from very high level to very uh, uh, individual. Thanks, Emily. So I'll just add a few more points since we only have a minute left. Um, I mean, really the first thing that came up was land cost and how high the value of our land is and which is just so inhibitive to younger farmers and beginning farmers. Um, we talked about making agriculture and farming inviting again and maybe starting at the 4-H and FFA a level to have more inclusive programming around regenerative agriculture, but also include more types of youth like urban youth um, that haven't been traditionally included. Of course, we talked about changing farm bill policy to reward ecosystem services. Um, someone brought up mandating local food use and local food production by Iowa institutions. Um, so that would be a market incentive. Um, um, education in community spaces such as local churches and um, education with ag cooperatives because they are really influencers to, to the farming community and can we offer incentives to ag cooperatives to sell and do the right more of the right practices. Um, and of course, you know, this question came up of like, do we build it and they will come or do we find the people and then we build like chicken or egg type situation. Um, so with that, it is 11. Omar, I want to hand it over to you quickly. Sure. Um, so I put my contact information in the chat box. Um, we want to continue to build on this because uh, we want to listen to all of you as the boots on the ground. Because uh, we want to inform, you know, the development of a regenerative agriculture uh, in the Midwest. So the overarching goal of this work is to improve our understanding of barriers and best practices so that we can improve conservation outcomes in the state. Uh, and ideally on millions of acres of farmland across the Midwest. So this isn't just about Iowa where we're talking regional scale. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, I want to I want to talk with you. I want to listen. Um, and if you want to stay engaged or are interested in being part of a future focus group or being interviewed, uh, please contact me. Uh, my email is in the chat there and, and then that's my direct cell phone. And it's been great hearing from all of you today and uh, it's, it's nice to leave uh, feeling inspired and having a, a sense of direction and what, what people are thinking about. So I wanna thank Omar and the Sea Change team at Iowa State and all of you for sharing your thoughts with us. This was really invaluable and really fantastic. So um, we have to rush off to our next session that starts in 10 minutes.